Good morning, friends. Happy Friday. It's the weekend, or almost the weekend. I know you're looking forward to it. Today is also the first day of May, May 1st. Congratulations, you made it this far in the school year. Um, yesterday we finished with the Night of Angels and we had a little mini history lesson. Um, today we're starting our new book, which I'm interested to see how it goes. Let's just dive right in and waste no time. So ain't, it ain't so awful falafel. Number four. Today's Sunday and we're moving again. Not everything fits in the moving truck, so our huge light blue Chevrolet Impala, or land yacht, as the used car salesman called it, is filled to the brim with boxes, pillows, and kitchen appliances. The back windows rolled down so the vacuum cleaner handle can stick out. I am 11 years old, and this is my fourth move. I haven't met anyone who has moved so many times before sixth grade. Normal families move once or twice because they find a house with a swimming pool or more closet space in the same town. Every time we move, it's to a new city or a new country. I was born in Abadan, Iran when I was in second grade. We moved to Compton, California. We stayed two years. For fourth grade, we moved back to Iran. Fifth grade, back to Compton. Now, we're moving to Newport Beach. The two cities are only an hour apart, but they might as well be in different galaxies. In Newport Beach, there's no graffiti on the walls or overturned shopping carts on the sides of freeways. You don't see any stores with broken windows. There are trees everywhere and the city looks like it has just became, it, it has just come back from a visit to a beauty salon. Where are the rusty cars with missing tires? Not in Newport Beach. There are a lot of those in Compton, usually on people's front lawns. If our crazy nomadic life has taught us one thing, it's this, don't buy stuff that breaks easily. Everything has to be packed sooner or later. Even our plants are made of plastic. Wherever we live, we have our fake red roses in the living room and the fake yellow daisies in our kitchen. They're ugly and don't look real at all. They look like those plants in horror movies that come to life and eat people. But they're one of, one of the few constants in my life. At least they're always there. The only time a kid came to my house after school in Compton, we were walking to my room when she suddenly stopped in front of the plants and asked what they were for. I thought that was a stupid question. I mean, how many possible uses could there be? They're just plastic flowers. But later I realized that they are so big and ugly that they look like they should do something. Maybe catch flies or squirt air freshener. As we pull up to our new home in Newport Beach, I cannot believe my eyes. Our house has two stories and it's surrounded by a huge lawn made of real grass. Do we have to take care of the whole lawn, Baba? I asked, trying to figure out where our part of the grass begins and ends. There is no chain link fence between the houses, so it looks like everyone's living in a huge park. No, my dad says. There are gardeners. I look at my mom to see how relieved she must be to hear this, but she's busy using the mirror on the side of the car to reapply her pink lipstick. Our house in Compton had a small patch of grass in the front and back. By the time we figured out how often we were supposed to water it, it was all dead. Some of our neighbors had fake lawns. From far away, they looked good, better than our real, dead lawn anyway. As we get out of the car, I see an older lady standing in the driveway, and she seems way overdressed for daytime. She reminds me of Mrs. Thurston Howell III on Gilligan's Island. My mother introduces herself as my dad tries to unload the vacuum cleaner, which by now is sticking so far out the window that it's almost hit the tree next to the driveway when we pulled in. I am the star in Yusuf 
Yusuf stay, she says, making the whole sentence sound like one word. Dezez Zormorund Yusuf say, she added, pointing to me. I smiled. I can tell the lady's getting nervous. She has no idea what my mother just said. She has this strained expression, like she's trying to smile, but only half her face is cooperating. My father holding the vacuum cleaner joins us. And the lady finally says, I'm Miss Mavis, your landlady. Hello, Mr. You, you, use her voice trails off, which is fine since we never expect anyone to get past the first syllable of our last name. Two points for trying, Lady Mavis. <laughs> kind of like what I just did. Then she gives him a key and shouts, do not lose this pool, pool key. She pauses looks at each of us and continues. If you do, you must pay $50. That's $50 for a replacement. Then, for reasons I cannot understand, she repeats herself, but this time loudly and slowly, do not lose this pool key. I so badly want to ask her, are we allowed to lose this pool key? But I don't. My mom stands there smiling like a statue. My dad's still clutching the vacuum cleaner, keeps nodding his head and repeating, yes, yes. He does that when he's nervous, which is often. I just roll my eyes and walk through our new front door. Our home is a condo, short for condominium. I figured this out when the landlady gives us a binder, rules for the condominium living, which we also have to return when we move out. Apparently, there is no fine for losing the binder. So Morod, my dad says to me, read this and tell your mom what it says. My mom hasn't learned much English. I always encourage her to try, but she says, as mas go ashe. It's too late for me. That's the most ridiculous thing I have ever heard, and I tell her so. This always makes her mad. She says, I should be a nicer daughter, but I am a nice daughter. I just don't want to be her translator for the rest of my life. The rule book begins with a welcome to condominium living page that shows a happy, good looking blonde family standing with another happy, good looking blonde family next to a barbecue. The father's holding trays of hamburgers and hot dogs. We do not look anything like the people in the picture, but for once it doesn't matter. If there is one thing that the Yusuf dies love, it's grilling. My dad calls himself the king of kebabs. I can almost imagine having a party with our new neighbors, just like in the picture, <clears throat> except that one of the families will be standing apart, holding a tray of bright orange, almost glow in the dark chicken that someone looks at, but no one tries. This is what happens when you use saffron marinade instead of barbecue sauce. trash talk. In a condominium, there are rules for everything. Chapter three, waste management is all about trash. You have to leave your trash out on Wednesday night for the trucks to pick up on Thursday morning. You can't leave the empty bins out. You have to put them back in your garage before the end of the day. You also have to put your garage in proper, your garbage, and sorry, in proper trash cans with lids that fit. You can't just willy-nilly leave garbage by the curb like some sort of trash sculpture. There's even a drawing of the right and wrong ways to put out your garbage. The wrong way looks like our trash in Compton. I translate all that for my mom. She looks frazzled. Why do they have rules for trash? I hope the landlady doesn't get mad at us, she says. Don't worry, maman. I tell her, I'll make sure we do it right. I know that my mom has found something new to worry about, something else to make her want to go back to Iran, where houses do not come with rule books and landladies do not yell at us about losing pool keys. I'm going to have to read the rules to my mom many more times until she learns them. I don't want us to be penalized for inappropriate waste receptacles. There is a whole section on penalties too. I slept on the floor that night because we donated my bed to Salvation Army. Most of our furniture in Compton had come from an auction of seized goods. I didn't know what that meant until I asked Mr. Samba, the librarian at my old school, Marion Anderson Elementary School. Mrs. Samba said that seized goods means stuff belonged to criminals and it's sold for cheap by the police because the criminals are probably in jail. 
When I told my mom this, she said it made her sick to think that she was eating off a table that belonged to a murderer. But my dad told her that no, none of our stuff belongs to murderers, only to people who had committed minor crimes like stealing apples from the grocery store. When I asked him how he knew that, he said he just did and told me not to ask so many questions. All I know is that my mismatched bedroom furniture was really ugly and had six digit numbers carved into the desk, bed posts and chairs. My dad said those were serial numbers used by the auction home. I wish they had used pencil, but I guess people dealing with criminal world usually have knives in their pockets anyway, or they just don't care. I hated my furniture and really wanted to buy a canopy. I always wanted one of those as a kid too, a canopy bed. I know exactly which one I want. It's on page 453 in the Sears catalog. I've looked at it so many times that the page is worn out. It's the most beautiful bed I have ever seen. I also really, really want a beanbag chair. Every time I see a popular kid on TV, she's in her room lounging on her beanbag chair. There is something cool about all the different ways that you can sit in it. You can sink in low, you can lay on your tummy, you can lie on your side, and you can do whatever you want. It's a chair with no rules. I imagine myself sitting on my beanbag chair reading a Nancy Drew book. Oh, one of my favorite series as a kid too. I imagine myself sitting on my beanbag chair, sipping chocolate milk through one of those bendy straws. I think about my imaginary beanbag chair every single day and how much more fun my life would be if I had one. But best of all, I imagine inviting a friend over. The minute she sees the beanbag chair, she knows that even if my parents speak a different language and I do not have a pet, we have no snack foods. I am still cool. I just have to convince my dad to buy one. I know that my family isn't poor, at least not compared to some of my classmates back in Compton. But when it comes to spending money, my dad's head and wallet are still in Iran before he buys anything. He multiplies the price by seven to see how much it costs back home. That's because one dollar is equal to seven tumens, which is the money in Iran. The problem is that everything in America costs more than it does in Abedin. This is obvious to me and I'm only 11. Still, as I drift off to sleep on the soft avocado green shag carpet of my new room, I dare to hope that my next set of furniture has no criminal past. California Dreamin'. The next day, my dad surprises me. We go to Sears and he says, Zomorod, pick whatever furniture you want. Are you sure, I ask? Yes, he says, go. This is the one, I say about a minute later, pointing to the white canopy bed of my dreams. It looks even more beautiful in real life than it does on page 453. What about those, my dad suggests, pointing to the matching nightstand, desk, chair, and dresser. I can get all that, I ask, wondering if someone has replaced my father with a very generous, long lost twin. I want to ask him if he's sure, but I'm afraid that if he thinks about it, he'll realize he's spending too much money, especially after he multiplies it by seven. My dad is still smiling. What do you think, my man? If it makes you happy, it's good for me too, she says. Ladies and gentlemen, that's about as much enthusias enthusiasm as I am ever going to get from my mom. This is the nicest bedroom set I have ever had all white, all matching, all brand new, no numbers carved anywhere. I am also allowed to get the yellow ruffled sheet in pillow set, plus the canopy cover with its lace border. I hope we stay in Newport Beach a long time and you can use this furniture until you graduate from high school, my dad says, patting my head. My mom doesn't look too pleased to hear that. Since my dad is in such a generous mood, I seize the moment. Can I get a beanbag chair too? A bean chair, he asked. I pointed to the one on display. The salesman who had been helping us asked if we want to try sitting on it. No, my dad says. We eat beans, not sit on them. That is when I notice a girl my age standing with her parents waiting for the salesman. I want to go back in time and leave before my dad started talking about eating the beanbag chair. 
the sales man tells my dad that the chair just happens to be on sale today. Normally it costs $26.95, but for a back to school sale, it's only $19.99. In my country, my dad says a bean bag is $2. Wow, where are you folks from? I ran, my dad replies proudly. As you know, we are very famous for our oil industry. Let me tell you about it. I would love to hear all about it, but these customers are waiting. The salesman says, pointing to the other family. I smile at the girl, she glares at me. My excitement about the furniture disappears and I suddenly remember that I am about to start at a new school again. All right, we're gonna leave it there. So far, so good. I'm interested to see how her first day of school is. All right, friends. So I hope you have a great Friday, a great weekend. I will see you next week. Um, toodles, thank you so much for watching.